Okay, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome back to our monthly donut festival. <laughs> so April and Kathy were out early this morning harvesting them before the crows could get to them. <laughs> I'm Dave Dooling, Education Director, uh, and I think this is my first lecture in about three years. Uh, it's been a while, so welcome back post-COVID. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, what we hoped was going to be the first Artemis launch uh, later this month. It looks like it's off until June. Uh, but NASA is doing things very carefully and slowly, uh, so uh, it'll be a little while. Uh, but basically, this is us going back to the moon. And the Artemis program uh, was named after Apollo's twin sister because there will be a woman on the crew on the first man lunar Sorry, old school, first human lunar landing. First human lunar landing. Uh, when we return in a few years. Now, this is not as rapid as Apollo, uh, and that could be a separate discussion on the politics, but I'm gonna talk right now about what NASA has planned. So, almost 50 years now, and we'll have a, we're planning a celebration in December of the Apollo 17 mission, the last human mission to the surface of the moon. That's uh, Jack Schmidt of uh, New Mexico, only geologist to go to the moon. And in about, uh, we're looking at about three, maybe four years, depending on how things proceed, uh, before we're back <coughs> to the lunar surface. The vehicle that we're going to fly on is derived from space shuttle. We'll talk a little bit about that heritage. It has the wonderful magnetic name space launch system. Not something neat like Saturn V. But the SLS is based on the space shuttle. So the boosters, the core stage, the main engines all derive directly from the space shuttle. And it compares quite well in size with the Saturn V from the 60s and 70s. So two twin boosters, five segments instead of four like we had on shuttle. And they will not be recovered. Uh, they will produce most of the thrust at liftoff to get the vehicle off the pad and above the bulk of the atmosphere. The core stage will be powered by four RS-25 engines. That's basically the old space shuttle main engine. In fact, the first SLS launches will use shuttle main engines pulled out of that program after the shuttle program. Uh, shuttle was grounded and discontinued and turned into museum pieces. The core stage derived from the shuttle external tank and is made on basically the same tools at the Michoud Assembly Facility in New Orleans. Same diameter. A uh, good deal longer, uh, burning liquid hydrogen, <coughs> excuse me, liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. The upper stage, uh, and this is called the interim cryogenic launch stage. And um, I'm very wary of that word interim because during the shuttle era, shuttle was supposed to have a third stage, which is called the space tug. Well, it's going to take a little while uh, to get that design uh, worked out. Didn't have the money for it, etc. So we used what was. Uh, originally called the interim upper stage until one day in a budget briefing I saw it was described as the inertial upper stage. Does that mean it's now permanent? They said, uh, yeah. So be very careful about government activities that have the word interim on them. They can last a long time. Uh, but the key thing here is the engine that it will use is the Pratt & Whitney RL-10 engine. You go upstairs, we've got one on display. So we've got the predecessor of the uh, third stage of the SLS already on display. What does SLS stand for? Space Launch System. You need if they call this something like the Neptune rocket, uh, uh, something like that, but they didn't. Okay, so uh, some of the testing that's already gone on, the launch escape system was tested out here at White Sands several years ago. And yes, it's supposed to do that. It pitches over, redirects it before the capsule is released for the parachutes to deploy and bring the astronauts to a landing in the water, not on the desert floor. Uh, more challenging is if you have to abort in flight. So this is a, a modified Peacekeeper uh, ballistic missile upper stage boosting the capsule to high altitude and speed, uh, just a little bit more than supersonic, and then the launch escape system fired. It did not recover the capsule on this one. They just let it crash into the ocean. Already had the first orbital flight test of the Orion capsule earlier uh, on a Delta IV Heavy from Cape Canaveral in 2014. Uh, that went quite well, quite well too, and included a splashdown 
in recovery in the Pacific Ocean. This is also using uh, uh, a variation on the shuttle main engine. Boosters tested up in Utah where they're manufactured by uh, the uh, uh, descendant of Thiokol Corporation which had the original shuttle booster contract. Uh, really chews up the, uh, the desert floor when they do it. <laughs> it's not something you could easily do on a test stand uh, uh, vertically. And this is the core stage being tested at Bay St. Louis, at the Stennis Space Center of Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Uh, the engines are not wobbling, they are steering, and there you can see they lock up nice and steady. So I was testing the hydraulic system to steer the engines back and forth. Uh, yes, rocket exhaust coming out is liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. What's coming out of there is steam high pressure steam, which is like why in our classes I like to tell the kids that rockets are really just flying tea kettles. Okay, the capsule that the crew will ride in, the Orion, multi-purpose crew vehicle. The names just keep getting more and more complicated. Uh, yes, it looks a lot like the Apollo spacecraft, and, and there's been a lot of moaning, oh no, we're just building something old and vintage and not doing anything new. It's just the shape that carries over from Apollo. Uh, the service module is being built by the European Space Agency. Uh, two things that actually do carry over almost directly from Apollo. The attitude control thrusters, the R4Ds, and we have a couple of those on display, <coughs> derived directly from the ones that were used on the Apollo service module and the lunar module. And the engine that will uh, correct the orbit, slow the spacecraft into orbit around the moon, and then send it back home, derives directly from the service propulsion system engine that was on the Apollo spacecraft. We have one of those on display as well. <coughs> so there's the size comparison. Orion is about three and a half feet wider. It will have four astronauts instead of three. They have a good deal more room in the interior. Uh, the manufacturing techniques, the technologies, everything are all quite radically new. And I'll give you a good example of that uh, a few slides down. Later this month, we should roll out to the launch pad for the first time. They will launch from pad 39B at Kennedy Space Center. Not 39A, where Apollo 11 launched. That would be really neat historically. But that pad has already been modified for use by SpaceX uh, Falcon 9 launch vehicles. So we'll be launching from pad 39B. Uh, here's the, the rebuilt mobile launch platform being taken out to the pad on a test drive. Uh, we're going to roll it out put it on the pad, make everything, fuel it up, do a complete countdown right down to about T minus nine seconds, the moment where you'd open the valves and light up the engines. You tank it, roll it back to the VAB, do some extensive tests, and we're looking at June, there we go, June this year for the first uncrewed, and I hate that word because it sounds like C-R-U-D-E, uncrewed flight test, uh, and that will go around the moon. It'll last anywhere from two to three weeks, depends on the phasing of the moon, lighting angles and so on, uh, but we will boost it out to lunar orbit. We'll use lunar gravity to help retailer the orbit around the moon, then it'll return to Earth with a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. Most of this uh, closely following the mission profile that would have later for the human landings on the surface. It will have a crew of sorts, Right, mannequin called Moonikin. <laughs> yes, Moonikin. And it has accelerometers and radiation sensors built into it. Uh, mainly, the accelerometer is the key thing to get a handle on how rough or, or gentle a ride the astronauts will have. The uh, two at the left are phantom torsos. These are built up from synthetic materials that mimic human bone and tissue and they have radiation oh, oh, oh. dosimeters placed on and in them to get a better understanding of what kind of radiation exposure the astronauts are going to get during the mission. And yes, deliberately did it in a female shape, <laughs> modeled it after female anatomy, because women are more susceptible to radiation damage than men are. So Artemis II, a couple of years hence, not quite, oh, in the interior, you notice it's a good deal different from what you may recall with the Apollo uh, command module. I'll show you a picture there in a second. Uh, entry exit hatch is on the side instead of directly above the astronauts' heads. Uh, hopefully, we're not going to have that blue painter's tape you can see in the access <laughs> tunnel at the top. And yet, don't think we're going to fly with that. Oh, and the spacesuits are derived from the advanced crew 
escape suits that the shuttle astronauts wore. So here's an example of the technology changes. The left side is part of the uh, instrument panel in the Apollo command module. The right side is for Artemis, advanced electronics throughout. Yes, uh, uh, one of the challenges is developing touch screens that will work with gloves. Not an easy thing to do because basically what happens when you, when you touch a touch screen with your finger is you're draining part of the electrical charge off that screen and your tablet or your phone measures where your finger is positioned and makes, bases the actions off of that. Uh, modeled, I believe, is after the uh, Boeing's uh, Dreamliner uh, glass cockpit, the instruments they have on that flight deck. I'm confused. Yes? I thought that um, because if it's unmanned and the dummies are going up, why are there people in the cockpit? No, this, uh, uh, excuse me. Uh, Artemis II will be a four-person four mission around the moon. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped that. Um, uh, Artemis II, two years hence. Uh, Artemis I is unmanned, uh, uncrewed, okay. whatever your preference is. Artemis II will have a four-person crew on board. And that will just be, let's see, do I have the, no, I don't have the trajectory yet. So it'll be one, four of the people in this picture. This is the uh, Artemis cadre of our astronaut core. Now save you the bother of counting, half are women. <laughs> half are women, nearly half are people of color. Asian, Hispanic, African American. One of them, one of these ladies, will be the first woman on the surface of the moon. When will they know? Uh, probably not for another year or two, at least. Yes, there will be extensive training ahead of time. Uh, NASA does not like to name crews too early in the process. In fact, I believe the Apollo 11 crew selection was not finalized until early 1969. Now, everybody who's in their training, most of the astronauts that we had in, in the Apollo group could have stepped in and done it, but the final choice was based partly on who was doing the best training. So the Artemis II mission will just be a circumnavigation of the moon and back. Yes. Sorry, David. Um, to, to jump ahead just a bit, when do they project that they will actually land again? Good question. <laughs> you, got a, you, got a, you got a bingo card with you? <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, we, we were supposed to have been in the position where we would have flown the first crewed missions by now. Um, things could have gone much faster. A lot of it has to do with funding. Uh, I heard one NASA engineer saying it's probably NASA going slow because they suffered from paralysis by analysis. <laughs> Everybody was just overanalyzing things instead of pushing ahead and getting it done. So no projection at all? Uh, the projection right now, I believe, is 26, but that could well slip. General, General Accounting Office says uh, uh, the funding's not there, there are safety issues that need to be resolved. Etc. So it could easily slow. So chances are you and I will still be alive to see it. I hope so. Unless I get you really mad this weekend. Oh, yes. Don't bet on that. <laughs> I said it less. The way NASA works these days, you need to have an envelope to your head. That says. Right. Yes, ma'am. Is it an international crew, or are they all Americans? There will be inter uh, there will be uh, uh, European and Canadian. And Japanese astronauts in later mm -hmm. missions. Okay, but all uh, those the, people you just showed are all Americans? Right. Okay. Initially, it's, it's going to be our crews. Okay, thank you. So there'll be a circumnavigation. So we're looking at 2025, maybe 26, landing Artemis 3, two astronauts on the surface of the moon, and two in orbit. And it's going to be this funny, uh, uh, they call it a near rec rectilinear halo orbit. <laughs> Acronyms are us. Uh, it's going to be a polar orbit looping far below the lunar south pole. Uh, this will provide nearly constant communication so you won't have far side blackouts. Uh, it provides more flexibility on the landing spots that you select. And in this case, we are going to the south pole. And I'll explain why in a moment. Uh, and again, the mission duration uh, is not fixed just yet. But two astronauts will be staying in the uh, uh, Orion spacecraft. Two will go to the surface in the Human Landing System lander, HLS. Uh, 
we don't yet have the gateway RV park, if you will, is what I call it, uh, in lunar orbit. Uh, that will come later. A Falcon 9 Heavy will launch the lander, and it will use an ion propulsion system over the space of about a month to get to lunar orbit. So there's going to be a different type of lunar orbit rendezvous. The lander is going to be sent ahead, and then the crew will arrive. We can get away with doing things like this now because electronics and systems are far more reliable than they were back in the 1960s. Uh, back then, you hoped that your, your electronics, everything on board the spacecraft was going to last until at least one minute after splashdown, but it didn't matter anymore. Uh, but we've gotten much better, in fact, so much so that we're working on uh, uh, separate missions on techniques for robotic satellites to refuel satellites in geostationary orbit because the electronics keep going. They just run out of fuel to maintain their position in geostationary orbit. So you've got a half billion dollar piece of electronics up there that are now useless simply because the gas tank is empty. Okay, this is the artwork that uh, SpaceX has the contract for the human landing system. This is the artwork they pass around. I don't really believe it. Because you look at the, you can see the two little tiny astronauts all the way at the bottom. It looks like something out of uh, uh, the movie poster for Destination Moon back in 1950. Uh, so two little tiny astronauts down there. Uh, you, you could have a dozen or more astronauts up on top there. This may be where Musk is heading eventually with his plans, but I think for the first landings, it's going to be a much smaller, much uh, more compact spacecraft. They just haven't released any artwork yet. And also, by this time, we uh, in the Apollo program, there were lots of press kits, drawings, detailed drawings of the lunar module, almost detailed enough that you could build your own, uh, uh, floating around a few years before launch. Uh, lots of stories about the spacecraft design changing, little things like the windows, the hatch size, this, that, the other. Uh, getting virtually none of that coming out of SpaceX and keeping it very close to the vest. So two humans on the surface, that's a uh, 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 NASA uh, engineering concept, uh, not necessarily what the lander is going to look like. And we'll talk a little bit about the spacesuit now. It's not your daddy's A7L suit. It can be quite different. A lot of advanced uh, systems inside, uh, and it will be evolving uh, better air for, uh, scrubbing systems, better cooling, better electronics. Uh, we are taking a design point from the Russian Orlan suit where the entire backpack is hinged, it opens, the astronaut just climbs into the suit, puts it on, your partner buttons it up from the back, and away you go. Helmet, the bubble, the gloves, everything are on there and ready to go. Makes it a lot faster and easier. The Apollo, I, I wore in a, uh, uh, a derivative of the A7L suit, did a two hour underwater spacewalk. You'd have to reach down, zip up, pull the darn thing over, it goes diagonally. Uh, the suit was great to move around it, but getting into it was a real pain. That gets, this gets rid of that. And this is where we're headed, Shackleton Crater. Named for the famous British Antarctic explorer, it's dark permanently. There's a handful of craters at the winter south pole that are in permanent shade, which means down below we could find possibly, and we've already had data from unmanned spacecraft, we can find one of the most important resources in the solar system. Water. A good for your life support system, help replenish it. B, you can break it apart into hydrogen and oxygen, and now you've got fuel and oxidizer. Okay, but that's not the end of it. This is really just the start of the build-up. Artemis IV, uh, uh, actually before Artemis IV, we will have the elements of Gateway, uh, which as I said is sort of going to be an orbiting RV park, uh, a miniature space station in lunar orbit, uh, and then Artemis IV mission, uh, astronauts will not go to the surface, they will outfit the Artemis IV, or rather the Gateway, in lunar orbit and get that fully up and operating. This is the concept, we have international partners, the Japanese are providing modules, so, are, uh, uh, so is the European Space Agency. Uh, so we'll have the Orion capsule docked to it, two astronauts on board that for the duration and two in the lander going down to the surface and back up. 
and there will, there will be research to be conducted on board Gateway. How long is their, their deployment? Deployment, that, that's uh, that the that appropriate it's word. Uh, it'll be on the order of uh, probably two weeks initially, and then extending outwards to a month or more as we get habitats on the lunar surface. So Artemis V, uh, the ESPRIT payload, uh, that module uh, uh, gives them extra living and working space, power. So there we have one, two, three missions, gateways added, then uh, uh, the landing, we start building up the surface. Lunar terrain vehicle, basically, this is going to be the great grandson of the lunar rover vehicle that you can see in these pictures that the Apollo astronauts had on the last three missions, and then build up to a pressurized rover, which would let you make extended jaunts from the spacecraft, from the base, uh, probably go out for three or four days and not have to come back. One of the, uh, right away, uh, one of the design requirements on the lunar rover vehicle and on the EVAs was you couldn't go any further out than the crew could walk back. Because if the thing goes bad, AAA is not going to come up and, and haul you back <laughs> home. You're, you're just on your own. So they would go out to the furthest point out to, say, where it would take them maybe five, six hours to walk back to the lunar module and then gradually drive their way back and time each stop and each drive time so that if the LRV decided to crap out at that point, you can still hit, uh, uh, walk all the way back to the LEM and you're safe. This will be more, more challenging. Uh, pressurized rover, basically it will be, be an RV. So you have two astronauts driving around on the lunar surface uh, to more distant locations to sample lunar soil, lunar rocks. And we still need to have eyes on the moon. As neat as automated systems are, the neat stuff we've seen uh, the Mars rovers do, uh, is still really helpful uh, to have humans there who can examine interesting outcroppings who are adaptable. You run into problems and humans can work it out faster, easier, because this is just a wonderful manipulation system. Yes, Donna. Okay. Um, backing up a bit, uh -huh. where they're sending on the, uh, Artemis One, they're sending little fake people up to test mm -hmm. their body stuff. Right. Well, we've been to the moon, so don't we know what's happening to our body? We know. Or is it because eventually we're going to stay out in here and hang around for a while, and that's why we want to know? Uh, it's a little of both, yes. We, we know a great deal uh, about what happens to the human body in space, and really the way I like to describe it is that we've gotten to the point that we're not getting the answers we need. We're understanding the questions that we have to ask. And this is why I'm glad we didn't go to Mars. Okay, 1969, I was at the Apollo 11 launch, and I really, a lot of us really felt in 10 years we're going to be on Mars. I'm very grateful now that we didn't go because we know so much more about what space does to the human body, especially in the long haul. One of the big surprises was on uh, the Apollo 14 mission. Uh, was it 14? Zer Irwin, who had the heart attack? 15. 15. 15. Uh, they worked so hard. They perspired and peed away so much fluid and electrolyte that Jim Irwin basically had a mild heart attack on the surface of the moon. We, we just didn't expect that. This is why in 16, uh, John Young and Charlie Duke had to uh, drink lots and lots of orange juice laced with potassium, and which tasted so bad it led to one of the more famous cursing incidents in space. <laughs> but that's another story. Uh, so we're learning what we need to ask. We're going to be outside the Van Allen belt, outside Earth's magnetosphere, the magnetic field that protects us down here on the surface. They're going to be exposed to high energy solar radiation and galactic cosmic rays. And we need to understand what that's going to do over the long haul. Radiation is rough on the human body, zero G is rough on the human body. Uh, especially the longer you up, the tougher it can get. So each astronaut is going to be a guinea pig. Yes, yeah, so that, that, yes, that was a very important question. Gradually build up the base camp, pressurized rover, habitat on the lunar surface so uh, you're not stuck inside the lander uh, uh, for, for a couple of weeks. Uh, 
And it's not to make things more luxurious, it's simple human factors engineering. People work better when not, they're not stressed by being crammed inside of a little tiny environment. As Claudia and I learned <laughs> last year, as we took our kids, our grandkids, on a two-week RV trip to Virginia and back, and we're still married. <laughs> yeah, but if that's to scale, that surface habitat looks like it fits maybe one person. Uh, no, it, it's, well, these, these, these folks are in the foreground. Okay, so the, the habitat's maybe a quarter mile back. It's smaller. It's, it's just basically the artist trying to cram everything uh, inside one picture. Speaking of the graphics, the one that's very evocative with uh, the sand, mm -hmm. is that an a artist's rendition or is that an actual photograph? That is an artist's rendition. Uh, we wish it, if it was a photograph, it means we would have been there. It's actually it's still from an animation, which, which works very nicely, but I was not able to get it to, uh, to work on this platform because it was just a format thing. Question, sir? Yes. How is all of the equipment getting to the surface from orbit? Landing stages, uh, basically descendants, uh, you know, great grandsons, great grandkids of the Apollo lunar module. Uh, so, it, these will a lot of these will come down on robotic landers, uh, fully automated. Uh, but it'll be the same basic stage that uh, the astronauts ride atop when they come down to the lunar surface. Rockets are the only way we can get around right now. That was a different talk I gave. Where's my warp drive? <laughs> we're still, it's the 21st century, I've promised warp drive, we're still riding on rockets. Where's my warp drive? Where? Where? Well, we don't know uh, how to do anything better than rockets. Lots of very sophisticated variations, but basically flying tea kettles. And NASA likes to talk about this as setting the foundation for deep space exploration, for going to Mars. A lot of people say we need to go, you know, the moon, been there, done that. Uh, just, just go straight to Mars. Uh, if we can't do it in our backyard, we, we have no business crossing the street. If we can't do it on the moon, make the technologies work there, understand the demands of human physiology and health, we have no business going any farther. So this, this can be a tremendous learning experience. We're also looking at <coughs> the moon and asteroids as resources for raw materials, uh, uh, for heavy metals, which could easily, uh, rare earth elements, they could easily be mined uh, because Earth has plenty of this stuff. It's just that it's so heavy that when the planet was molten, it all went to the interior. We can't dig down two, 3,000 miles to get it. It's still on the surface of asteroids. In fact, what little we have on the surface of Earth right now really was delivered by asteroids and meteoroids over the last few billion years. We can mine resources in space and not have to worry about pollution problems, etc. In fact, a lot of the material that's left over could be used to build the structures for large spacecraft. You wouldn't think about building a spacecraft out of pure iron, but that's a possibility in space because the mass is less important than the course of corrosion. Rust is not going to be that much of a problem either. So just about everything we can find on an asteroid in space would be useful. In fact, uh, uh, much of the technology, a lot of the design work that went into the Orion and Artemis programs uh, came out of an earlier effort to explore an asteroid. So the launch system, the spacecraft, we go to Mars, we talk about taking the Orion spacecraft to Mars and back, and a lot of people get the misunderstanding that the four-person crew is going to live in the Orion capsule for nine months going to Mars and nine months coming back. Okay. That's a recipe for murder in space. <laughs> this would simply be the ascent and entry capsule. They would have larger modules to live in going out there. So surface operations, everything we do on Mars is going to grow out of what we learned doing EVAs on the lunar surface gateway. will lead to Mars and spacecraft, uh, same with the base camp, uh, advanced spacesuits. Uh, and one of the reasons why we're going to this particular design, uh, and look, uh, concept I've seen, excuse me, a number of times is where uh, you back up to a port on the pressurized rover or on the lander, dock to it, and the people inside open it. And that way you don't have any dust coming into the spacecraft. It's all sealed up. The stuff's nasty. It's dangerous. It's ragged. It, is, it has microscopic uh, uh, sharp surfaces. It can tear up the lungs. 
they tear out seals and mechanicals. So you really don't want getting exposed to that stuff. And the Orlon uh, suit design is very good at avoiding a lot of that. Because you, that first picture I showed you, Jack Schmidt on Apollo 17, his suit wasn't sparkly white from the dry cleaner anymore. It was gray from the dust. Okay, we are not alone. We've also got the Artemis Accords, uh, which are designed to set a framework, a legal international framework, for exploiting resources in outer space. And it's, it's been written to be compliant with uh, at least three space treaties, the one on peaceful uses of outer space, uh, uh, the launch and registration uh, treaty, which basically is if you launch something into space, you own it, whatever happens, uh, and uh, the return of astronauts convention. And astronauts, believe it or not, have diplomatic immunity for the duration of their mission. So uh, something goes wrong, your spacecraft lands uh, in the middle of North Korea or India or China or uh, you know who knows where, the astronauts have diplomatic immunity. It was written deliberately to protect them that way. Uh, so we have a number of partners, uh, uh, Republic of Korea, Japan, European Space Agency, Canada, uh, Poland, New Zealand, <coughs> Luxembourg. Believe it or not, Luxembourg Space Agency. Who would have thunk it? Okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and part of it's uh, uh, to address the issue of uh, uh, who owns materials that you would bring from the moon or asteroids. The Space Treaty from 1967 specifically bars or, or, or countries uh, promise, uh, signatories promise that they would not lay claim to celestial bodies. So we put our flag on the lunar surface. It wasn't Columbus claiming this land for Queen, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. It was just saying we were here. It's a neutral zone like Antarctica. Yes? Um, China and Russia are conspicuously missing from here. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Good question. Yes. Good question. Uh, Russia did, deliberately did not sign on to it. They said it was too U.S. centric. They didn't like the way it was being done, uh, and that was also why they are not a participant in the Artemis program. Uh, no, and I'll get to them in just a second. Uh, so the moon, you don't own the moon. The country cannot own the moon. Theoretically, uh, Elon Musk can plant the SpaceX flag on the moon and claim that it's his, but legally that's not going to be recognized. But what about materials that he might mine on the moon, and he's bringing back iridium and platinum and lots of other stuff that we need for advanced electronics? Is that his? Is it still the moon? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting legal argument was uh, in 1976, 77, I believe it was, Cosmos 954, uh, a Russian spy satellite with a plutonium reactor on it uh, went out of control, re entered, scattered plutonium all over the Yukon Territory of Canada. Canadians go out, they clean up the mess, they send a bill to the Russians, said, no, it's not ours. Canadians say, wait a minute, under the registration committee, this is your satellite. You're responsible for it. They said, no. As soon as it started burning up in the atmosphere, it quit being our satellite. It became something else. It's your problem. Still some very subtle legal issues that have to be worked out. So partly in response to this, there we go, China and Russia <coughs> set up the International Lunar Research Station concept. This partnership is basically their answer to the Artemis Accords. So what they're looking at are a series of advanced unmanned landers uh, uh, or automated landers uh, on the lunar surface, uh, some doing sample returns, and the Chinese have already demonstrated this once with the spacecraft, the Ru and the Russians, the Soviets did it uh, twice in the 1970s uh, to explore it, and then eventually, Chinese lander on the moon. So they, they, they aren't that far behind us. In some areas, they are ahead of us and they're very methodical and persistent. So it's a bit of the tortoise and the hare race. This tortoise is persistent and just keeps moving. Gets the objective in sight and just keeps moving towards it. And sometimes the tortoise gets moving pretty fast. This is the concept for their lander that uh, uh, has been circulating. Uh, uh, they haven't publicized it too widely, hence the grainy nature 
of the images. But it's kind of interesting because you look at it, you get two almost like little helicopter cabs, one on each side of the lander. The astronauts ride down already suited, and they just pop the front door open, use an Orline rear entry like we're going to use, walk down, do the lunar exploration, get back in, and return to orbit and to the main spacecraft. I'm sure the farther down the road they have more advanced landers, they have pressurized habitats to let their astronauts, their taikonauts, stay longer on the surface. So I'm looking forward to our next step. And yes, I'm that kid in the middle of the picture. I was in college, I get to, got to work as a summer hire security guard for Apollo 11, so I can say I was part of the team. So I'm looking forward to see, seeing what we do next, more than 50 years later. Questions? Yes, Billy. Are any other countries seeing the uh, influx of private enterprises pushing this, this envelope like we're seeing in this country? Yes. Uh, India uh, has uh, an advanced space program. Uh, and that, that, that's going to be a topic of one of our, our talks in the next year or two. Uh, New Zealand is host to a launch facility. Uh, I believe it's the Electron rocket flying out of, out of uh, the uh, Northern Island. Uh, European Space Agency, of course, has the Ariane vehicle, and they have launched a number of very advanced uh, spacecraft. Uh, South Korea, a number of countries buy satellites and launch services from various commercial providers, uh, but they're also working on their own capability uh, uh, within their borders. Uh, North Korea has, what, what, Chris, a launch record of like two and five? Yeah, They've had a couple not, very, not very good. Not very good. Although but, I think what he's asking about is, is we have like SpaceX yeah. and, you know, some of these private entities, Blue Origins, and the Virgin Galactic, they're going up. Besides the governmental agencies, like you were mentioning, right. so I think he's curious if there are more of the non-governmental civilian space entities in the other countries like we're seeing here. Uh, there, there, there's a number of them, uh, but they're not quite as heavily funded as we are. Uh, and, and frankly, really, uh, our Virgin Galactic started off as a British venture, and they came here for the launch site, uh, uh, business environment, and so on. Uh, so that, that could be another talk altogether, the business of space. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mo most of these countries are, are taking it stepwise. They're not trying to go for the Saturn V right away. Uh, build small satellites, small launch vehicles. Uh, uh, get your fingers burned then and figure out what you're doing. Then build up. Yes? Um, okay, with all these people trying to get up there, the private sectors, the government ones, all of those folks, are they coordinating where they're landing or are they all going to land in one area? Oh, on the loose surface? Together, or what are they going to do? Uh, and, and that's part of the Artemis Accords is to is transparency so that everybody's aware. Uh, you know where I'm operating, uh, I know where you're operating, so that we avoid each other. And it's not just uh, that I set up my tent a little bit too close to yours out in the National <laughs> Forest. Uh, when I come in, it's going to be on a rocket. You don't want my rocket flying over your base, and if something goes wrong, crashing into your base. So the trajectory needs to be off to the side. Uh, don't want to have me blowing dust all over the place. And this is one of the things that uh, uh, Beth O'Leary at New Mexico State University has been working on space archaeology, protecting the Apollo 11 and 17 sites as national parks, trying to give, give them some sort of legal protection because everybody's, all the tourists are going to want to go and stand where Neil Armstrong was. Okay, so that would destroy the place right away. Even coming in to land next to it, you're going to blow dust over everything. You really want to land several kilometers away and then drive up on a rover and then be very careful how you explore it. Because one, one of the points of interest is going to be uh, how have uh, the spacecraft, uh, the, the, what's left of the spacecraft, the descent stage on the lunar module, the lunar, lunar rover, how have those aged baking in the sun and then freezing in the cold two weeks on, two weeks off for 50 years? It will tell us a lot about weaknesses that might be in our spacecraft designs that we don't even suspect yet. Okay, and, and when everybody does their thing in their separate locations, 
do they, like, Joe over here discovers plutonium and Mary over here discovers titanium. So they think that's what it is. Do they have like a little powwow where they go, oh, there's this here and that there, and do they all get together and share info, or are they just like, no, no, this is what I know, and you're not going to know it. Or do we shoot at each other? Yeah. And these are things. These are things that the Artemis boards are designed uh, to work out. So if I refined wood or material, and I've got all these neat metals, okay, the product of my refining process is mine, and I send it back to Earth, and I, I sell it and do what I want with it. But I've got a primo site. I can't claim this as SpaceX territory, or US territory, or Chinese territory. Can a claim jumper come in and mine the same site where I've been working? So economic exclusion zones of some sort. Uh, it's going to be fun. we got fun times up ahead. Yes? Do you know specifically what about the Artemis Accords that China and Russia weren't interested in? Because it seems like pooling resources and getting there together would be significantly better for um, them. Well, I mean, just financially speaking, like it. Uh, well, uh, one aspect of it is that the Wolf Amendment uh, to NASA funding about 15, 20 years ago specifically bars NASA from engaging in international activities with the People's Republic of China because of the technology transfer issues. I mean, they, they go in and they've strip mined uh, uh, U.S. databases to begin with. Uh, I worked at the Solar Observatory at Sunspot uh, for uh, over nine years, and we had a, a, the first few years that we were there, we had this really neat Air Force-funded telescope for monitoring space weather. And one day, we just took all the, really, the Air Force took all the data and put it behind a firewall because they found that the PRC had scientists publishing papers based on the images, on the data from those telescopes without giving credit to U.S. Air Force ISIS. And they just didn't say what telescope they got it from, but we were able to recognize it as ours. And it had been left open for any scientist to use. The only uh, condition of use was give credit where credit is due. Well, they weren't doing that. And that's just one of many, many things that have been done. Uh, It'll be interesting to see how it shakes out because look at what is going on in the South China Sea with China building up artificial islands and, ex and claiming expansive territorial waters in violation of accepted international law, which has been standing for centuries. Uh, but I said it's interesting, it can also be very dangerous. Uh, the Russian space program, frankly, uh, general, the general perception is it's gotten quite weak. Uh, uh, they've got quality control problems. Etc. cetera, uh, some aspects. We're a little anal retentive sometimes of things we do, sometimes aspects they're a little too wild west in you know, what they do, a little too loose. Uh, and also technology transfer issues. Uh, they simply felt it was too U.S. centric. Uh, uh, I, I would need to bur burrow down into the details, uh, but they felt that uh, it was just too easy for uh, uh, capitalists sometimes <coughs> to do stuff. And, the Moon Treaty would have declared the Moon and uh, every, everything else in the solar system as common heritage of mankind. So if I went up and I refined the palladium, et cetera, and bring it back, right off the top, X percentage would go out to the World Bank or some other international financial agency, and it just simply made it too so unattractive. Uh, even as early as it was back in the 70s and 80s. So unattractive for the potential of developing extraterrestrial resources that the treaty was stalled and died. That's really interesting, thank you. Yeah. Yes? You talked about uh, materials and bringing them back and not being able to claim them for a specific country. Um, but I guess two scenarios, what if, you know, say Elon Musk does uh, start bringing back materials. Is that something that, with that X percentage off the top to whatever World Bank or whatever, that would then become something he could refine and sell? Okay, the refining would be done in space. This is one of the neat sure. aspects about it because whatever tailings you've got from the mine, they stay there in the asteroid, <laughs> and uh, it, it's no problem. You don't have the environmental impact issues that you have here on Earth. Uh, there are several places uh, in the U.S. that could have. Uh, they could be mining the rare earth elements and the need for advanced electronics, 
but they've been stopped by environmental permitting issues. Mm -hmm. You would not have that in space. So what would be coming back would not be raw soil. It would be Already billets, right, you know, of, of uh, uh, whatever materials were needed. And there's been talk about, oh, it's going to be a trillion dollar economy mining stuff in space and completely overlooking the fact that what makes this stuff valuable is there's not much of it. My first, best, most important economics lesson was from Fractured Fairy Tales in the Rocky and Bullwinkle show mm -hmm. back in the 60s, where King Midas basically gets all the gold and he wakes up one morning and his advisor tells him, you're now the poorest man in the land because the people went over to the rutabaga standard. They were trading in rutabagas instead of gold. If this, these materials become incredibly common, the value goes down. Mm -hmm. That's simple economics right there. Uh, but we need it in order to make the electronics valuable. So it will happen eventually. Asteroids, in some respects, are easier to get to than the moon. They're certainly easier to land on and take off from. And you could just set up an automated mining facility on the moon or, uh, or on an asteroid. And uh, in fact, the, the one suggestion has been made, we find an asteroid that's going to head headed for Earth, it's going to impact <coughs> in another 10, 20, 30 years, whatever the prediction is. Just set up a mining operation on it and use a rail gun to fire the refined packages towards Earth. Action, reaction, that railgun will also gently retailer the asteroid's orbit. Solve two problems at once. Oh. Yes? Okay. This crater thing that Shackleton may, crater. Mm -hmm. may have water in it, mm -hmm. is the intent to build like a little camp next to it to then go and research yeah. it? That's the plan. Or, okay. Yes, that is the plan. And it's not a lake of water, it's not icebergs or anything like that. Uh, it's, it's actually makes the Sahara look like a swimming pool by comparison. But it's there. And it's, uh, it's from collisions with comets uh, over the billions of years. And the stuff is simply there in a cold trap. So it's very simple. Run the soil through, container, heat it up, drive off the volatiles condense the water, and you've got rocket fuel. Yes, sir? Do you have any idea how much water is there? Uh, it's not so much the quantity as the concentration that is the challenge. Uh, uh, quantity, you could probably uh, have a good two or three lakes worth. I, I forget what the exact number would be for Shackleton and, and the other shadowed craters. Uh, but it's going to be in such small quantities in the winter soil that is going to take a lot of work to get it. And it would have to be an automated operation. Initially, humans would be prospecting for it, but when you find it, when you find out what the quantities are, find out if it's really worth your while, if you need to figure out a plan B, uh, uh, that'll be automated. Yes? There's more on the far side of the moon then. Yeah. No, the far side uh, is going to be just as baked out as near side, because remember, uh, far side is in sunlight for two weeks. So when we have new moon, far side is illuminated. So people like to talk about dark side of the moon. Well, the moon always has a dark side. It's just it's changing all the time, just like Earth does. Yes? Uh, following up with that question, uh, on the dark side of the moon, if you will, was more exposed to impacts? Yes. So you might find more of the material mm -hmm. there on that side, correct? Right, and also uh, uh, we found a lot of the rare earth elements uh, at the samples from the near side that the Apollo astronauts brought back. Uh, the far side geology and terrain are quite different. It's more cratered. There are a lot of mares, uh, uh, lava plains, on the near side. And in, in this part of what we're, we're still trying to understand about the formation of the moon uh, and how it is married to the formation of Earth because it was a result of a collision with Theia, our size body, striking Earth. Yes. So you said that we're going to be um, base camping more or less in a perpetual shadowy area. Uh, so far, a lot of our, lack of a better word, equipment that's out there is solar powered. So what is going to be the continual source of energy? Okay. Initially, uh, uh, they're not going to they're not going to camp inside Shackleton Crater. They'll be camped outside the lip, so in an area that does get sunlight. So that's but, still but a eventually huge factor. For, for large scale operations, uh, it's uh, an argument between going totally solar or nuclear. 
because if you have solar, then you can only use half of that power to run your base because the other half is going to be charging batteries for two weeks of the night. Same as space station does right now. They're only drawing, only half of whatever load they're drawing is, is going into running the station. The other half is charging the batteries for nighttime. So it'll be the same on the moon, whereas with a nuclear power source, uh, you can just size that to about, say about double what you need because the power source will drop off with decay with time and will be refueled. But then you've got all sorts of arguments. Oh no, we shouldn't be launching radioactive material into space. And actually, it's quite simple. <coughs> that, that, that was my question. Mm -hmm. How safe is it to transport radioactive material out to the moon? It's quite safe. Uh, and and the uh, uh, ironically, the case in point is the Challenger tragedy, mm -hmm. because they found the upper stage uh, for. The, Challenger was carrying a data relay satellite on top of a two-stage uh, solid rocket uh, that was going to boost the satellite to a higher orbit. <coughs> the batteries of the satellite were intact. The two solid motors were intact. They were not designed to survive that kind of a breakup at high speed. <coughs> Any radioactive material that we have ever launched in space has been in a, radio, in a, uh, a cask designed to survive being hit by a high-speed lo locomotive. Literally, that's how they test them. 75 miles an hour and a diesel runs into them. If it doesn't survive, go back, redesign it. Uh, we launched uh, a plutonium source for a, weather, for a weather satellite out of Vandenberg in the 1960s. Rocket blew up, went into the drink, we recovered it, cleaned off the power source, checked it out, it was operable, launched it on the next satellite, it worked fine. <coughs> Actually, the, protect, the degree of protection they have on that stuff, it's very safe. Good to hear. <laughs> and for second opinion, yeah. our boss used to operate reactors on U.S. submarines. Mm -hmm. Although we're not going to launch one of those anytime soon. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, Kathy. Oh, one more. Yes, sir. Yeah, I got a comment. As far as mining on the moon goes, you're going to end up with the ore that has to be refined. Excuse me. And that's going to take uh, yeah. another entire operation. Yeah, 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 yeah refining the ore. Uh, and one of the challenges would be doing it in 1 6 gravity instead of 1G. Everything we know about mining materials is 1G. 1 6G is going to be different. So that's going to be a neat bit of physics and engineering we have to work out there. And doing it on an asteroid where you're really pretty darn close to 0G will be another challenge as well. Uh, you can only do that by centrifuging. Cannot, pr cannot produce artificial gravity except by spinning stuff up. And that may indeed wind up being the solution. I've been on one of those right before, and I want to do it again. <laughs> <laughs>